feel as I have to give a disclaimer at this point because my latest research is actually indirect research, so I don't have a lot of pangolin photos to show you, um, but I do have lots of lovely photos of China and the people that we're working with as well. Um, I'm also going to mention the forensic genetics and um, some plans for more research in Singapore before finishing off with um, some videos of the pangolins here in Singapore. Um, so to start with, like, I want everyone to think about like when was the first time that you heard of pangolins? Um, so for me, like, I have to admit that I managed to graduate with a degree in zoology and I haven't heard of pangolins. And um, I think that's probably true for a lot of um, children and young people. Um, there isn't a huge amount of educational material about pangolins available. Um, there are a few books, I'm working on another book at the moment which should be out next year, aimed at six to ten year olds. Um, this one just came out, Pits and the Pangolin, um, but that's for very young children under six. Um, so I think there's a lot more that we can do. If anyone feels inspired to produce um, some educational pangolin material, please do. Um, these are actually collected by a colleague at Taipei Zoo. Um, I hope that Singapore Zoo will have them soon. So like I said, I, I graduated without actually knowing what a pangolin was. And it wasn't until I moved out to China, and I was living in China, that I first heard about them. And it's a, quite a sad story, because actually my friends were eating them at very you know, high status banquets. Um, this was a long time ago, this was 2003. Um, and so I thought I should try and find out what this unusual animal really was. And I was very surprised that it's a mammal. I mean, it looks like a reptile with scales. Um, but the mammal, um, but it is the only mammal that has these scales, and they're very similar to human fingernails. Um, so it, they're used in traditional Chinese medicine, but I mean, you may as well just kind of you know, chew on your own fingernails. Um, a lot of people ask me, like, where did these scales come from? And there was a paper in 2013 by a German lab who have suggested that perhaps they evolved about 53 million years ago. Um, so the genes. Um, which regulate the development of these nail plates, which make the scales, are very similar to the genes of the hair follicles. Um, so it, it's probably evolved from, from the hair. <laughs> so I'm sure you already know that pangolin is the most heavily trafficked animal in illegal wildlife trade. And there are two main drivers behind that trade. It's the demand for the scales for traditional medicine and also the demand for the meats. So I wanted to help, I wanted to you know, try and um, do something to stop this. So the first thing was that I started researching pangolins. And I discovered that the early natural historians assumed that because the pangolin looks a little bit like the other anteaters, that it must be somehow related. And it is, um, it is a specialist and termite feeder, but thank goodness for genetics, because we've actually realized that the pangolin here is, is not that similar to the other anteaters, armadillos. So the other anteaters are up here in Zanatha, whereas the pangolin has its own order, the Polydota, mm -hmm. and that actually um, shares common ancestry with the carnivore, the cats. So pangolins are actually more similar, like, well, more closely related to cats rather than the other anteaters. Um, so within that order of polydata, there's just one family, the mammidae, and within the mammidae there are eight species. So um, these four here are the four Asian species, and then number one, five, and these two little ones are the four African species. Um, the common ancestor used to actually live in Europe, but now we just have these two groups, with the four in Africa and the four in Asia. Um, the the uh, black belly pangolin is diurnal, whereas the others are all nocturnal. Um, we only discovered this one, the Palawan pangolin, in 2004 because it's actually a cryptic species. It's very, very similar to the Singaporean Sunder pangolin, um, but the genetics actually is a little bit different. So, like I said, it is a mammal. So, you can see the soft hair um, on, on the underside. Uh, this is an African species, so there are no hairs uh, coming out from the scales, whereas our local sunder pangolin would also have hair here. Um, it, 
looks as though this mother is lactate, lactating. Um, the pangolins have five digits just like us. Um, they have special adaptations, so the muscles within the ear and also the nostrils can close tightly shut so that when it's feeding the antitermites can't enter. And then I love this photo at the bottom here. Um, so this is how the mothers um, care for the young by carrying them around. This is quite a big baby. The, 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 the babies are actually called pango pups, which I love. Um, when they're a bit smaller, they ride further down like at the top of the tail. Um, the mothers look after the, the small pangolins for about five months. They start weaning them around one month. Um, we have no idea how long pangolins live for in the wild. In captivity, they seem to live for about 20 years. Um, but there's still a lot that they can, can learn about pangolins. Um, so I wanted to show you this kind of quite cheeky little video of the pangolins. <laughs> So the pangolins come from very, very special. Um, they actually extend all the way through the thorax to the end of the ribs, and there's a special sac which, which um, when the tongue is um, inside, it stays inside its little sac. Um, and when the adults stick out the tongue, it can be sort of 40 centimeters. Um, because pangolins don't have any teeth, um, they have to use like, other methods for digesting food. So similar to the gizzards and chickens, they deliberately inject um, small pieces of stone and grit, um, which helps mechanically break down the, the ants and termites. And they also um, have a specially adapted stomach, which is very strong, and it has all these kind of like little, almost like little forms inside the stomach. So I'm really pleased that more and more people um, are picking up on this message that penguins are important and that. You know, there are some shocking statistics that in the last 10 years over a million pangolins have been um, traded illegally. And because the pangolins only produce usually one to occasionally two offspring a year, there's just no way that with such a low reproductive rate that when we harvest and poach illegally at this level that the pangolin populations can be sustained. So I joined the IACM pangolin specialist group so I could try and like do something to help. And one of the first things that happened was that I was actually sent to Singapore and Wildlife Reserve Singapore kindly hosted the very first pangolin conference in 2013. Um, so we were tasked with looking at all the available evidence to um, establish what the current threat levels for the different species were. So I'm sure most people here have heard about IACM Red List. Um, so we had to um, decide like which category to put pangolins in, and we actually moved both the local Sunda pangolin and the Chinese pangolin up into the very highest category of threats, so they're now both listed as critically endangered. Um, you can't really get any more threatened than that, the next level is that you're a bit of an extinct animal. Um, for the Indian pangolin and the Philippine pangolin, they're both endangered as well. Um, an interesting thing that you'll notice from these distri distribution maps that we made um, is that the local Sunda pangolin in yellow here actually overlaps with the Chinese pangolin, and we think that they're able to coexist because they occupy very different ecological niches. So the Chinese pangolin is more subterranean, and it digs burrows, um, and it hibernates for several months underground, whereas the local Sunda pangolin is more arboreal, um, and it's more opportunistic about where it sleeps as well. They do also dig burrows when they're uh, looking after the young pangolins, but most of the time they just sleep in tree hollows or even in grass. So they're the four Asian species. Uh, the pangolin pangolin is just here. Sorry, the colors don't come out very well. Um, so the four African species um, are listed as vulnerable. That's mainly because most of the um, evidence that we need to classify uh, the threat status is, is data deficient. So they're all listed as vulnerable, but the truth is we don't really know what the situation is. So I wanted to include this photo, it's just a gratuitous high-tech photo that I really like. Um, it's actually an MRI scan of a pangolin. Um, so this defensive curl is how the pangolin protects itself. And in the wild, it's brilliant. Um, you know, the lions and the tigers, they kick them around like footballs and they just can't really penetrate through the outer layer of scales. But obviously, against a human, that's quite a useless defense mechanism, so we can just pick them up. Um, so when, when the pangolins are born, the scales
nails are um, very soft and they harden within the first few days of life. Um, I'm sure you've all seen these like articles where they kind of say another another two or three times a pendulum scale is found in Hong Kong. Um, just to put that in perspective, that represents thousands of pendulums. Um, <coughs> And it's, yeah, as I said, it's not just the scales which people are interested in, it's, it's the meat. And the sad thing is that as uh, the pangolins become even more rare, the price of the meat actually goes up and the demand for the meat has increased. Um, I'm actually really happy with the efforts that China are making. They changed the law last year, so it's now illegal in China to eat uh, pangolins and other endangered animals, and you can get 10 to 15 years in prison. So I think that was a really great step in the right direction. I'm really happy about it. But um, for many other countries, especially Vietnam, we've still got a long way to go in changing the legislation. So what can we do to help pangolins? There's a lot that we can do. Um, so one thing is that there are now all these wildlife apps. So if you're ever on holiday in Vietnam or anywhere else and you, you see pangolins being traded illegally, take a photo and please do report it. This is the one that traffic recommends. Um, called Wildlife Witness. Um, um, yeah, so I think that's a really good one. And I think we can all make a difference in our own way. So just talking about pangolins and telling our friends and our families about the issue can make a huge difference. I think Singapore is an extremely influential country within this region, and people within this in Southeast Asia respect Singaporeans. And I think what we say and the, the, the decisions that we make here can really impact on the outside of Singapore. Um, and we can definitely all support community projects, so I mean, coming here tonight is, is, is great, thank you. Um, we've got the Biodiversity Festival coming up on the 26th to, no, is it 28th of June, sorry. Um, and we're looking for volunteers to help with that, so if anyone wants to get involved, that would be useful. I'd also love to see more things happening in schools. Um, I think like we can do a lot more to educate the public about pangolins. Um, through societies and school events and um, things you know, within our local areas. Um, so the next point here is um, a little bit more technical. This is something that we're working on with ADA at the moment. So currently pangolins are listed in um, Appendix 2 of INCITES, the Convention in Trade of Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Um, so they're in Appendix 2 with zero quota, which means that they can't actually be traded internationally but they can still be traded domestically. Um, thankfully, like countries have their own laws to try and stop that, but there are still some who, who aren't doing very much. So if we can succeed in moving them from Appendix 2 to Appendix 1, that would mean that domestic trade is also illegal. So um, it looks as though we might be successful next year at the COP in 2016. Um, so for further research, a new group in Singapore has just been established. It's called the Singapore Pangolin Working Group. Um, and we're bringing together NGOs and government groups you know, and parks, all the different uh, stakeholders in Singapore, to, to work out what we really need to do for the local population. Um, so yeah, to so watch this space, because I think there'll be more happening for pangolins in Singapore soon. Um, outside of Singapore, um, there are a lot of other um, NGOs and charities and different people involved with pangolins. Um, I've just chosen these because they happen to be the ones which I personally work with closely. Um, so in Vietnam, we've got Save Vietnam's Wildlife and EAV, and then Conservation International do quite um, a lot of work with pangolins in Cambodia. Um, Kaduri Farm are fantastic, they do all sorts of things in China. This one deserves a special mention, One Stop Brunei, because there's a young man in Brunei, Chavez, and he's um, got the whole community working with pangolins. They're now building um, a rescue center as well for wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, very young man. And then traffic, um, which you've probably heard of, have been established for a long time, experts in illegal wildlife trade. Um, Edge of existence in ZSL, they actually have um, permanent research fellows, so they have one in Vietnam and one in Nepal. Uh, RIMBA at the bottom left, they're doing a great job in Malaysia of creating an informant network and making sure at a grassroots level there are things happening for conservation on the ground. Uh, Lippi and my partners um, at the Indonesian Science Institute, we do a lot of work with forensic genetics. And then Katala Foundation are based in the Philippines and Palau as well. So 
I mean, there's more than that happening. Like, I hope you're inspired to um, take a look at the web pages because they've got some really great handling activities. You can link to all of these through the IECM Technology Bachelor's Group website. So, for my own research, um, most recently I've been in China um, investigating the status of the threats of pangolins using indirect survey methods. Um, so we work with a team of volunteers and I really like working with volunteers because it, it's great to see like their enthusiasm for wildlife and, and I remember doing it when I was their age as well. So um, I was joined by uh, Yangwei Jinghua from um, Hanan and Sanyo Universities and then Fu who's a local chef as well which is very lovely. Lots of good food. <laughs> Um, so Hainan, I'm sure you know, is just uh, this big island south of China. And we were working in um, these three nature reserves. I've trained a team who are now, actually right now, doing more interviews in these three. So I'll go towards the southwest. Um, so we visited 60 different villages, which are all quite remote and, and hard to reach. So. Um, I have to say thank you to Gaduri Farm for lending us the four wheel drives. So we wouldn't have been able to do it without that. Um, and they're really beautiful nature as well. So I do recommend that if you have time to visit Hainan, then you should you should try to get down to these nature reserves. Um, there, there are places that you can access by, by road. And you can also get fishing permits and things like that as well. But Kaduri have done a great job at making sure the fishing is sustainable in, in these reserves. So this is the kind of village that we would visit. And I think you can see from the picture how, how um, impossible it is to patrol these vast areas. Um, so in order to protect the wildlife in these forests, like, you really have to work with the local communities and, and, and make sure that the attitude um, is a positive one towards conserving the local wildlife. So the biggest, uh, well, the, the first nature reserve that I went to was Bowen Lake, and um, that's the national nature reserve because they also um, have the Hainan given the most endangered mammal in the world um, in this nature reserve. It's quite a mountainous region. This, this reserve is about um, 67 kilometers squared, and the mountains are about, um, about 1,500 meters. Um, there's a very heavy hunting pressure on the pangolins, so there aren't very many left unfortunately in Baolong Lung. Um, but Jiaxi, the one just south of Baolong Lung, um, I think there's more hope for the pangolins. Um, the local people do still find them in Jiaxi province. Um, similar to the other nature reserves, they all have issues with kind of, you know, lowland farming encroaching on the wild areas. Um, it's difficult to sort of regulate that. Um, but people are, are trying to educate the villagers about it. Um, Yingling is going to be um, a model nature reserve for China. It's the largest of the three that I went to. It's actually 500 kilometers. Um, you can see how like, the rubber plantations um, just take over. Um, the access to these areas, you can see from the tarmac on the road, is, is improving. So there's been a change in, in the way that the pangolins are traded because it used to be local people, whereas since like the 1990s, it's actually been people from outside of the area coming in to, to poach. Um, so unfortunately, as the quality of the roads improves, the access to the pangolins improves. When we, when we uh, speak to people, we always try and make sure that the um, questions that we ask like, don't have any negative impact. Um, most of the people we speak to are, are farmers, and their ecological knowledge is really fantastic. Um, because they're, they, most of them still use very traditional farming methods, they're outdoors like, every day, and um, they really know exactly where the pangolins are and, and what they're doing. And um, there are also a lot of like stories and local legends about the pangolins. Um, the one which you hear most commonly is that pangolins increase your longevity, so if you keep the scales, it's like a protective talisman that will defend you. Um, we do some of the interviews in cafes and restaurants um, because the restaurant owners t 
tend to know about the local trade, <coughs> especially the black markets. So they're really great informants for us. <coughs> Um, and none of this would be possible without the nature of directors um, who help us tremendously and actually go with us to do the community interviews most days. Um, it's a really beautiful area that I do recommend going. This is actually the village where the director grew up. So every time that we get to a new village, we have to have these big banquets. And, um, <coughs> And um, there's, so there's a huge amount of time invested in like relationship building. Um, and they also, each village has its own like local wine, its own local baiju, which I just can't stomach unfortunately. But you do have to drink it, like it's part of the career. Um, and then after these banquets and the drinking, the people are really helpful. And <laughs> 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 so, like, I mean, they tell you exactly where to go and find the kind of buildings and do it. And it's not, I want to say, it's not just like the men that help us. Like the women know an awful, an awful lot as well. Um, and actually, sometimes I find, I mean, maybe it's because I'm a woman, but like I find that nothing gets past these women. Like, you know, they, they share all the secrets about the village and what's been going on. <laughs> <laughs> And I love speaking to the old, older people. Um, so this lady is about 89 years old. And it's great because they give a really interesting perspective on the community and how, how things have changed. And this lady was saying that, you know, when she was a child, people had a lot of superstitious beliefs about the pangolins. And I think China's done an amazing job at um, dispelling those superstitions. They've worked really hard at like, making sure that people no longer believe those kind of superstitious things. Um, so, for example, when this lady was a child, um, if you saw a pangolin during the daytime, a curse would be upon your whole family and all your friends and everyone that you knew. And so you had to take that pangolin home, kill it, drain the blood, um, cook the meat, and then invite everyone that you knew to, to eat the pangolin. And then you had to stay indoors and wait for the sunrise the next morning, and only then would the curse be lifted. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So luckily, people no longer believe things like this, but um, the story still exists. <coughs> um, so I put this slide here, like, um, because this one represents something that's very close to my heart. So I don't want to say exactly who, but some of the men in this picture, they used to be poachers, um, very, very good poachers. And the local wildlife department have actually recruited them and, and trained them and sort of rehabilitated them. So now these ex-poachers are actually the best wildlife conservationists and like my own dad actually devoted his life to working with young offenders and rehabilitating them and, and I really do deeply believe in that concept and I, I think that you know people can change and working with the poachers is, is a really positive thing. So China are doing a huge amount to protect the local wildlife, it's very impressive. When you go to the nature reserves, um, you see that they've divided them into departments, like small regions, and each region has a team who patrol the, the wild. And these people sleep out on the hillside, um, catching poachers, um, and I mean, it's a big commitment. I, I was really impressed by what they're doing. And they also develop these um, educational tools for the communities. So, so up here they have like posters that sh show all the different endangered animals, um, pangolins up here on the blue poster. And they seem to work really well, like people do pay attention and, and local people can tell you actually which are the endangered animals and which are the ones that they shouldn't be hunting. Um, so I've included this because within the IUCN there's, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about whether or not we should um, suggest that communities have a quota um, for harvesting a small amount of animals that they can um, keep for cultural reasons. So, for example, like trophy pieces and um, kind of just hunt a small number of animals um, in exchange for protecting the, the rest of the population. Um, and I mean, I think maybe in Africa and some other countries, perhaps there's a place for that. But I'm not sure about 
its relevance for Asia because the situation in Asia is a little bit different. Like, we really don't have very many candidates left. And I actually like the zero tolerance policy that China is using at the moment and that really strong um, style of enforcement. Um, but I just thought I would mention it just to show that there's, there are different opinions about what is the best conservation strategy. So I'm kind of coming to the end of what I want to say about China. Um, so I should say thank you to um, this man, Dr. Samuel Terry from the Zoological Society in London, because he paid for this research. Um, I think the volunteers had a really great time. Um, they, <laughs> they, yeah, the villagers definitely had a good time. Um, and um, what the volunteers said to me is that they most enjoyed the horse riding. Um, but both of these girls actually grew up in the city, and so they haven't had that much contact with nature. Um, I think to participate in this kind of project they can really like change people's um, um, direction and, and values. And certainly, like the children in the village, really paid attention to what we were doing. And so, just by being there, just by participating in this project, I think we really helped to raise awareness about about conservation issues and local wildlife. Which moves me on to like why I came to Southeast Asia. So I first came out here in 2001 via um, Singapore on my way to Indonesia because I was working um, uh, for a conservation group doing biodiversity uh, field studies. So we were doing baseline mapping of, of areas that had never been explored by scientists before. So it was the first time that these areas had been documented. And um, we were actually taught to survive in the forest. So they had these ex-military people that taught us how to make traps and snare traps and how to, to hunt, basically, and um, how to you know collect water from, from the roots and uh, the stems of the plants. So, so my first introduction to Southeast Asia was actually training how to be a hunter. <laughs> but I think my dad would be proud that I moved on from that. So I'm working with Indonesia again. Um, this time from the enforcement side. So we do a lot of forensic genetics. Um, we're trying to trace the origin of these um, unknown pangolins that they seize from the illegal wildlife trade. Um, so it's, it's only possible because of the IUCN network. So this is Gomo, who's the head of mammals for Indonesia. And then Tati and Julian, so they run the genetics lab at Lippi in Indonesia. Um, and we're, gradually expanding the network, so we're now working with Malaysia, Vietnam, and Brunei. Um, so uh, yeah, I hope that it's going to be useful for tracing illegal wildlife trade. So I've been working a lot overseas, and I think it's about time that I really did something for Singapore. Um, so I'm putting together a proposal to um, begin radio tracking the local Singaporean pangolins. So uh, I've finished the application, I hope that it gets accepted, we'll do that later this year. So, so I promised you some um, stories um, from Singapore and pangolin videos. Um, so this is actually the very, very first thermal image of a pangolin. Um, and if you've seen the Wild City documentary, you probably recognize it. Um, so about a year ago, I was asked to help find pangolins for this documentary, which was a very short question for what turned to be, into be an enormous task, which took months. Um, and luckily, like, everyone was willing to help, so students and, and friends and, and co collaborators were all sending us their photos of, of pangolins. Um, so I have to say thank you to Kelly Tan for this one uh, from her camera trapping survey. Um, there's been a big camera trap project for pangolins in Singapore, um, so hopefully there'll be a population estimation soon. Um, and it wasn't just photos, people started sending me videos as well. Uh, so I've selected a couple that I really like. Um, the first one is from NTU, and um, it's from my friend Santiago, who um, his neighbour um, was surprised to come home and discover a pangolin actually in his bedroom. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I hope you like this one. His reaction is very funny. <laughs>
So that's actually the video that inspired us to um, go, go time to you with the big thunder and eventually they managed to film the documentary. So it was all thanks to that video. Um, so the second one, the last one, is um, was a lucky find by Kathini um, on Venus Drive in the Ritchie. I think that shows you how curious the pangolins can be, you know, it's like, instead of running away, it's like looking straight at them. Um, so what to do when you see a pangolin? We're trying to update the advisory, because um, there is one that AVA produced, but it's a bit outdated now, so um, hopefully we'll be able to make this public soon. Um, if, if you see a pangolin and it's healthy, um, do quietly observe them, perhaps take a photo of them in touch. And then if they're unhealthy or they're at risk, especially if they're close to a road or on a, a busy, dangerous road, um, please call A because it's 24-hour helpline and they'll, they'll come and rescue the pangolin. And if the pangolin is dead, they'll also collect the roadkill to take to the museum. Um, and then if you see any pangolins, if they're dead or alive, uh, please do um, give Seaver a message at mammals.seaver.com because we're trying to collate the data from Singapore. Um, and then the last point is really important. Like if you see any poaching or any, any illegal trade of the scales or the meat, then contact ABA immediately on this number 6 a or 5 to Okay, so if you want to read more about the Pangolin Conservation Action Plans, uh, this is the most recent one by ACM, the Scaling of Pangolin Conservation. Um, and then you can also check out the IUCN website as well, the links for the different projects research things. Okay, so if you've got any questions, then <coughs>